Breakdown FM, where we break down news, views, and the hip hop movement. Davey D hanging out with you, Hard Knock Radio. On the fi- phone line with us, co founder of the Black Panther Party, Bobby Seal. Bobby, we wanted to have you on as we were looking back at what would have been the 70th birthday of Huey P. Newton. And we wanted to see if you could share maybe some thoughts, some insights, some things that have been left out of the history books that we really need to take and maybe build upon um, when we look back at the legacy of this organization that you guys started in 1966. Yeah, the Black Panther Party, my organization, the Black Panther Party, I'm the founding chairman and national organizer of the Black Panther Party in the United States of America. Huey P. Newton is the founding minister of defense of the Black Panther Party. I organized 5,000 people in 49 chapters and branches throughout the country while my friend Huey Newton was in jail. Me, Eldridge Cleaver, Kathleen Cleaver, Fred Hampton, I mean, I could just go on and on with different organizers around the country. In all those 49 chapters and branches across the United States of America, we put up free breakfast for children programs to help organize and unify the people's electoral votes, free preventative medical health care clinics, free sex selling testing programs. When I initiated this whole programmatic framework, my friend Huey was in jail, but I initiated these programs, the concept being a special political strategy. That political strategy was that we needed to unify the votes of the people in all these grassroots, poor, low-income black communities. And by doing that, hopefully we would move to be able to, in the future, take political seats. And with those political seats, particularly in local areas, if we could get the majority of seats in coalition with other left radicals and others, we could wipe off the books the racist laws manifested in city charters, manifested in county uh, uh, legislative frameworks. and mat- We could wipe these regisla- le- uh, racist pieces of legislation off the books. In other words, we were attacking what we call institutionalized racism. Institutionalized racism, the crux of it literally was none other than the laws themselves primarily. That's the institutional aspect of it. Right. In other words, when Sister Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus, there was a law that some racists had written in the state legislature that said black people either had to get up and give their seats to white folks or move to the back of the bus and sit down. And even if you move to the back of the bus and sit down, if the white folks wanted to sit down, you have to get up in the back of the bus seat and give your seat up. That's just one law coupled with a thousand other races legal structures in the United States of America. Anyone want to know about this? Read Leon Higginbotham's Shadows of Freedom. This brother, Circuit Court Justice, third Circuit Court Justice out of Philadelphia, was a prolific writer on civil rights as it's related to the racist laws in this country and the history of it based on racist laws, based on the precept of white supremacy, coupled with the precept of so-called black inferiority. Now, This is what we were attacking. This is what I was about, political electoral community unity. If we could muster that in our civil rights movement, in our political revolutionary movement, then we would have a a better fighting chance. So that's where I was coming from. The Black Panther Party was an organization that started out patrolling police. That was just one political issue. Of, of, of out of the ten point platform and program, the ten point platform and program of the Black Panther Party. Yes, it did with the need for full, need for full employment. Another point of the need for decent housing. Another point of the need for decent education. Another point of the need for preventative medical health care. Other points about rights in the courtrooms and not being tried by all white juries and so on. We summed it up. I summed it up. I'm the one that got that on the tail end of our 10-point platform and program that Huey P. Newton and I together wrote. We wrote the 10-point platform and program in a war on poverty office where I was employed. I was employed at that time by the city government of Oakland, California, Department of Human Resources. I was the community liaison for the North Oakland Neighborhood Service Center, and I supervised all the youth who work in the center, and I also supervised the summer youth jobs program of over 100 youth, 25 males, and 76 or 78, uh, um, 25 females and, and 76 or 78 males. I supervise all this stuff, and that's 
At that time, while I was still employed by the Department of Human Resources, is when Huey P. Newton and I finished the 10-point platform and program. The 10-point platform and program is the original founding documentation of putting this organization together. Right. Now, a lot of people want to look at us, oh, they were tough, they were bad, but it wasn't about that. People don't understand something. I was an engineer at Kaiser Aerospace and Electronics in 1962 when I first got interested in the 60s movement. I'd already done four years in the United States Air Force structural repair high-performance aircraft. At Kaiser Aerospace and Electronics, I worked on the Gemini missile program. You know, I did non-destruct testing on all engine frames for the Gemini missile program, all three stages of exhaust housing for the Gemini missile program. Right. It's just that I, as a young man, got very, very interested. When I hit, went to hear Dr. Martin Luther King speak at the Oakland Auditorium in 1962, mm -hmm. I've never forgotten part of that speech. When Dr. Martin Luther King was saying, we're going to, he was, he was, running down all the different categories of businesses and frameworks that discriminated against people of color. And he says, we're going to also boycott these bread companies. I'm not, I'm trying to tell you something that inspired me. And he says, and we're going to boycott Kilpatrick's bread company and Langendorf bread company. And we want to boycott wonder bread company too. We want to boycott them so consistently and so profoundly. We want to make wonder bread wonder where the money went. Now, <laughs> That Martin Luther King, and you have to imagine, Oakland Auditorium holds 7,000 people. It was 7,000 of us there. I was just one young student. I mean, I wasn't even known. The Black Panther Party didn't even, didn't even exist. Right. But I hit the floor in a standing ovation with all 7,000 people, praising and understanding that Martin Luther King was telling us what we had to do, some uh, tactics and measures we had to do to try to end racist discrimination. So that organization was profound. My friend Huey Newton, Officer Fryer, tried to kill him, okay? Literally, when he told Huey to get out of that car, Huey says, what am I under arrest for? See, and I knew Huey. You know, I knew Huey very well in the way he could articulate the law and make his legal points. And as we'd done it so much in the streets before, patrolling police. And I, 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 the way, and Huey says, what am I under arrest for? He says, move, get out of the car. Then Fry according to Huey, snatched the door open, says, out of the car, Newton. And Huey got out of the car, and the Fry pointed to the patrol car in the back. He says, walk to the patrol car, Newton. And Huey started walking ahead of Fry. And as Huey walked, Huey told me this after the statute of limitations was over. He told me exactly how it happened. He said, as he was walking, and he says, he says, Bobby, and as you know me, I'm telling him, anytime you move a person from one spot to another, technically you're under arrest. He says, and I said that, and as I got in the front of the patrol car, I turned around and demanded to know if I was under arrest. He says, and I saw Fry had pulled his gun out. He was, I grabbed the gun. And I remembered, he had done that before when we was in a fight with Berkeley police way before the party started. He would say he grabbed the gun and they shot him. You know what I mean? Shot him in the side. Now, in effect, Fry wound up getting killed. Other people were there, what have you, et cetera. Officer Haynes tried to shoot. They proved in court that the first bullet that hit Fry came out of Officer Haynes' gun, right. trying to shoot Huey, who was falling down to the ground. Anyway, my friend Huey Newton was found not guilty of first-degree murder, not guilty of second-degree murder, and was convicted only of third-degree voluntary manslaughter. So my point is, at that time and in that period, prior to his trial, we sponsored Eldridge Cleaver and I organized and put together a free Huey P. Newton birthday rally at right. the Oakland Auditorium, 1968. And this was February the 17th. Today is February 17th. And in that rally, we had a packed auditorium. And we had the coalition group of SNCC with us. We had Congressman Ronald V. Dellums with us. He was the only politician and the main politician that first came out. People got to understand something. I knew Ron Dellums before he ever elected, was elected for office. I knew him when we was having various meetings in and around about University of California, various meetings over in San Francisco and other places that Ron and me and Huey and some others were showing up at. So me and Huey was talking about the need to maybe get out in the streets and patrol police. We were talking about early in early 66. We didn't start the Black Panther Party until late October 66. Right. And in this period, and I've never forgotten that when we left the meeting, Ron caught up with me and Huey. He said, hey, you guys, hold on. 
He said, now you guys articulate a whole nother level. He said, I've been thinking about running for political office. He says, and y'all talking about going out here patrolling police with guns and law books and stuff. He says, I don't know. You know, I've been in the Marines and everything. He said, maybe I should be with y'all. And I said, wait a minute, Ron, you going to run for political office? He said, yeah. I said, well, we need you to run for political office. He said, what you mean? I said, well, my, I said, my program idea is that that's what we want in the future. I said, we want to organize it. I said, we patrol the police just to capture the imagination of the people. And Huey reaffirmed that, just to capture the imagination of the people. And I said, the objective is to unify the people and unify their votes and take over those political seats. I said, and if you're going to run for political office, you need to run for political office. And boom, and that was our first relationship before the party was started. So by 1968, naturally, I called on Ron, and he says, I'll be there to speak and do anything to support you guys, man, definitely. So Ron V. Dillums was there. Our apprentice, Buncher Carter, who later the FBI and the COINTELPRO killed January 1969. Uh, 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 Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael was there. H. Rap Brown was there. John James Foreman was there, myself and others, etc. Huey P. Newton's mother was there, Huey P. Newton birthday rally. A packed audience. I mean, from the time in 1960, I was just one student there with a packed audience here in Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm. And here it is, 1968, before Martin Luther King is killed, before Martin Luther King is killed. And we are packing that same Oakland Auditorium, celebrating Huey's birthday. But to celebrate Huey's birthday was that it was a free Huey Newton birthday rally. That's right. what it was about. Okay. Wow. So when we look back, you know, um, and I'm, I'm glad you're giving us that, that full history. That's a, lot to, that's a lot for people to really take in and, and really look at. Um, Huey became like a symbol, so to speak, for... for, for Huey for, became not only the symbol... Huey personified a, 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 a level of resistance against racist oppression that we've been subjected to for two, three hundred years in the United States of America. That's what that was about. Right. That's what Huey became. When Fry tried to kill him, and he didn't, and he, and, and Fry got killed, and then Officer Haynes got wounded, and then they put Huey on trial. You see, but to get Huey out of jail, I knew. So you have to remember something. When that happened to Huey that night that Officer Fryer tried to kill him, when that happened that night, I was in jail already. Mm. You see? Yeah. Now, the second person who was with Huey that night, they thought it was me because they did not arrest that person that night. <laughs> so I'm in jail in Sacramento, California. Remember, if you remember, May 2nd, 1967, I led an armed delegation into California State Legislature. Not Huey, me. I led that armed delegation. That was a strategy thing that Huey and I had put together. But my point is, is that I was in jail doing six months on a misdemeanor, uh, disturbing the peace of the California State Legislature. No gun charge, just because we got our guns back. Right. Okay, a lot of people, oh, you went up there with guns, and that's a no, 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 no. That was now, the guns were legal. People can never, some people can't get that in their head. The guns we had were legal. Huey was two years in law school. Before we even started the part, we researched every law on the guns. So we had guns and law books. And the law books is important. Tape recorders. You send them getting out, and a disciplined group of people where Huey was able to articulate. I'll never forget that real first well-organized police patrol that we was out there on that night. Walkie talkies, I'm in one car, Hugh is in the, driving the other car. We got seven party members in each car. All of them have weapons. Half have long guns, half have shotguns. No gun is concealed. As long as a gun is not concealed under the law in the state of California, it is not illegal at that time. Right. Different now, different now. But my point is, when that cop looked up and saw us and all these 50 people standing on the sidewalk, and uh, Huey was telling everyone, you can stay here and observe these policemen. Uh, we have a right to do so. We researched the law, so everyone stay here. You're exercising your rights. And the cop turns around, you have no right to observe me. And man, 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 give Huey credit for everything. 
Huey says, no, Southern such California State Supreme Court ruling states that every citizen has a right to stand and observe a police officer carrying out their duty as long as they stand a reasonable distance away. A reasonable distance that particular rule is constituted as 8, 10 feet. I'm standing approximately 20 feet from you and will observe you whether you'd like it or not. And some sister kind of tipsy on the sidewalk. She say, well, go ahead on and tell it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> the cop says, is that gun loaded? He says, I know it's loaded. That's good enough. And he says, well, I have a right. He says, step back. You have no right whatsoever. He went off into some Supreme Court ruling somebody versus so-and-so and so-and-so. Therefore, this is my private property. You cannot remove my private property from me without due process of law. Step back. You cannot touch my weapon. And some tall brother standing over at the can. He said, man, what kind of Negroes is these? We were disciplined. Everybody had a little uniform on. Everybody knew not to point weapons at people because if you point a weapon at a person, and if it has a live round in the chamber, it's constituted as a loaded weapon. If you point a weapon at a person inadvertently with no intention of shooting under California law, it constituted assault with a deadly weapon. So we knew all this stuff. Right. See? What, what people got to get in their heads, this was not a bunch of cheap, macho stuff. This is not what we were about. You see what I'm getting at? Right. This was about articulating constitutional democratic civil human rights, articulating the law, standing and observing, following the law, and blowing the policeman's mind, and then capturing the imagination of the people in the community. Wow. That cop got his little arrestee and drove off. Wow. I said, brothers and sisters, my name is Bobby Seale. I'm the chairman of the Black Panther Party. Uh, this is Brother Huey P. Newton. He's the Minister of Defense of the Black Panther Party. We're a new organization in the community. We're here, and we're going to be organ in, from, in the future, now and into the future, going to be organizing uh, a political, electoral, community unity. We're going to organize all our votes. Right. And we're going to opt for some power seats, the power seats in the city council to, to begin to end institutionalized racism in America. Then Huey went on to explain to people that we have a new organization. We have 5624 Grove Street. Uh, we have meetings every Wednesday night at, at 7 p.m., Saturday at 2 p.m. at 5624. Uh, when you come down, you can have political education sessions with us. We have various books that we're reading, and we're teaching the law, and we're organizing people, and there are other programs. You do not necessarily have to carry a gun, Huey says, because we're going to have a lot of organizing beyond the gun. Right. Now, this is the beginning of the Black Panther Party, out there beginning to patrol the police. That was that night, I think it was the, near the second week in January 1967. We created the party October. In fact, the finalized founding date of the Black Panther Party was literally October 22nd. Wow. Even though we started writing notes for the 10-point platform and program on October the 10th, then rewrote them again, and then went to see Melvin Newton, Huey's brother, Melvin, with our 10-point platform and program. He did some correction and looked at what we was doing, because Melvin, Melvin Newton, Huey's brother, was doing graduate work at the University of California at the time. Okay. And then we went to see Richard Ioki. And right. showed Richard Ioki the 10-point platform. And Richard Ioki was flabbergasted. He was like, whoa, you guys what? And he would say, Richard, we know you collect guns, man. Because Richard did have a lot of nice gun collection. Richard, you have some old Civil War collection of guns, and he had some modern-day guns. He said, man, give us a couple of guns because we're going to start patrolling the police. <laughs> and Richard gave Huey an M1 carbine and gave me an Army 45. Wow. But I already had a 3030 Winchester at home. Right. And I also had a pump shotgun because, see, I was raised with guns. You know what I mean? Right. I'm talking about my father bought me my first 30-30 Winchester high-powered rifle when I was 12 years of age. I have hunted all over Northern California, all the way up to the Oregon border, up to Modoc County. I'm just saying deer, bear, and I've all hunted all kind of small game, all in the valleys. Uh, I've got shotgun hunting, rifle hunting, uh, squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting. Pheasant, duck, you name it, bear, lower county, upper county, mule tail deer, and so on. My point is, I was just raised a hunter and a fisherman, and I was also raised a carpenter and a builder. So right. My father's a master carpenter and a master builder. Right. So I'm just saying, I was lucky to have a lot of trades and a lot of skills when I became a grown man after the United States Air Force and working right. in the engineering department. And so when like I asked were... for a job at the Department of Human Resources to run the youth jobs program and to be the community liaison, the board there looked at my resume and said, my God. <laughs> you, you were set. 
you were definitely hey, I, sent. I, 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 I was ready. And I was also in college and we, um, part-time with nine credit hours as an engineer design major. Let me, so let I'm me, just saying. Let me, let me ask ahead. you this. Let me ask you this, Bobby. You know, um, this is fascinating history, and, I'm, and I'm, I know a lot of people are appreciating this. Um, just like, you know, as a person, um, how, how was Huey? How, how did, how, you know, what was the interaction like with you all? Did you all have a lot of debates? Did you all uh, pal around a lot? I mean, what was it like, you know, just the, the two of you all as you all were just starting to, you know, to, to form all this? When, when Huey and I, I met Huey in a handshake one time, saw him again another time, shook his hand, blah, 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 blah. But I was in an anthropology class, what, in 1963. And I'm arguing with the instructor about the need for correct social science reference to black people. Every time you talk about white people, you say Caucasian. Every time you talk about Asian people or American Indian, you say Mongoloid. I said, then when you start talking about us black folks, you say Negroid. And I said, I don't think Negroid is appropriate or correct social science reference. And I got into very debates and arguments in the classroom there, you know, blah, blah, blah. And with, with all of that, what happened is, is that I kept doing that for two or three class sessions. And then I got Richard Ioki, my friend, Virtual Morale. Virtual Morale and I created a Black History Fact group, not Huey. People try to say Huey did it, but Huey didn't do it. And Huey knows he didn't do it, but that's not the point. My point is I got them, and then I got Huey Newton to come to the class. And there we are arguing and debating about the need for correct social science reference. And I remember Huey getting up in the back room because he wasn't he wasn't even matriculated in that class. And Huey told the instructor he he suggested for correct social science reference to black people he suggested Africanoid as opposed to Negroid. And I jumped up out of my seat. I'm up in the front of the class. I said, "That's it." I said, "I said that's what we have to. That's what we have." To. So the instructor said, "Sit down, Mr. Seal." So I sit down. And she wrote the terminology on the board, Africanoid, underlined the syllable. She said, okay, I can accept that. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, we've got to equalize the terminology. She said, Mr. Seal, you've been arguing for two weeks. I accept this. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. Every time you can make reference to black folks, you're going to say Africanoid. I said, then you're going to make reference to people, people of color who are Asian or, or American Indian. I said, you're going to say Mongoloid. I said, well, when you get to the white folks, you say Caucasian, Caucasian this and Caucasian that and Caucasian this. Right. He says, what are you trying to say, Mr. Seal? I says, from now on, let's equalize the terminology for correct social science reference, anthropological reference, Africanoid, Mongoloid, and when you start talking about white folks, Caucasoid. I said, so we can equalize it. So my point is that's when I really first met Huey. You know what I mean? So that day, I said, come on, man, I'm going to buy you lunch. <laughs> says, what? I said, come on, man. I said, you, you saved the day in my arguments in that classroom. So I took him over to Joe Ethel's Cafe, the black cafe across the street from Mary College. Told the sister who's now the waitress, and I said, come in. I said, you see this man here? Give him anything he wants. Hmm. Give him one, two, five hamburgers if he wanted. I said, give him fries, pie a mode, milkshake, whatever he wants. I said, here. So I pulled out my little wad of money, <laughs> and I gave, gave her $3. This is a tip for you to serve this brother here. And so we said, so he would say, where you get all that money? Where you get all that money? I said, what do you mean where I get all this money? He said, you got a wad of money? I said, yeah. He said, you got a scam? You got a scam? I said, no, man, I ain't got no damn scam. I said, I work. You work? I said, yeah. <laughs> where do you work? I said, Kaiser Aerospace Electronics. What do you do? I said, engineering department, you know, non destructive testing on the... He said, oh, you got a trade. I said, I got two, three trades. Oh, you, you, how old are you? I said, how old are you? He said, he's 19. I said, well, I'm 26. I says, you know, I'm 26, 27. I said, I'm, I'm six years old than you. I says, I got trades, man. So that was when me and you began to know each other. You know, we'd, he would talk about fighting a guy named McElvain who tried to take his wine in the past as we walked down near my house. And then he says, uh, what would you do? Would you defraud the guy like that? I says, no, nah, I'd have shot his ass. I said, nobody come up to me trying to take nothing from me. I said, I'd have shot his ass. He said, you got a gun? You got a gun? I said, I got a whole lot of guns. He says, what? I says, come on, man. I'll show you. What? Show me where? I said, I live right there. I live right here across the street from Mary College here. I took him in and took him to the back room. In my bedroom. Nobody but me in there. One twin bed. I mean, I'm ex-military, so my bed is made with hospital corners. You see what I'm getting at? Right. The whole side of the wall is a long table. On that long table, I have two large drafting boards. 
On the wall is a tall picture of the Gemini missile, another picture of a couple of other missiles, another picture at the top of the B-52 bomber, the B-47 bomber, the F-105, the F-102, etc. On the right-hand side, there's a picture of Martin Luther King, uh, and also I've now put up a picture of Malcolm X, and I have a stacks of books, black history books, because I've been studying black history at this time for almost a year and a half now. And then my pistol laid there in this holster. And so I took it, blah, 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 flipped it out, unloaded it, and showed it to Huey. So you got a guy. I said, I got a lot of guns. And I walked in the closet, showed him my right, my, I took him out of a case, my 30 30 Winchester high powered rifle. And then, you know, put it out of the case, made sure it was unloaded, let him look at it. Went to the other room, got my father's 30 300 Savage lever action, and brought that back and showed it to him. Then he showed him our, our pump shotguns. You know, because we're hunters. You think? Right. So he was shocked. And then he had bumped. I have I had a, a trap set covered up with a sheet. And he had bumped into it. He said, whoa, 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 what's that? I said, that's all right. Sit over here, Huey. And I pulled the sheet off. So I'm a jazz, jazz drummer. And he says, uh, you play drums. I said, yeah. I turned on my 360K high five player, blah, blah, blah. Jordy was on, do 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 I couldn't make it. And he uh, came in Monday morning at my engineering design major class <laughs> at the door and walked in asked the instructor, I need to talk to Bobby Seale. And I got up and walked out and brought Huey back out into the hall. I said, what's the matter, man? He said, uh, I got in a fight <laughs> at this party Saturday night. And this guy came running upon me and... Uh, uh, I thought he was going to jump on me, so it was a steak knife uh, sitting on the table where the rest of the food was, and I picked it up and I stabbed him in the face to keep him off of me, and now he's talking about running around, he's talking about he's going to kill me, and I want to know, can I borrow your pistol? <laughs> I said, yeah, Huey, hold on, man. I said, look, man, you remember you went to my house, you met my mother, you met my father. I said, no. Just go to my house. You can sit on the front porch, or if you want to get inside, just knock on the door. I said, Mr. Seal, Bobby said, because I could wait. My mother and father will let you in. I said, and let me get my drafting board and stuff. I said, go on over. Go, go, Huey. I I'll see you in a minute. So I got my drafting board and the see-through carrying case that I had and all my instruments and left and went down and was coming across the street. And I got across, across the street, Richard Ioki and Virtue Murray. I said, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. Come running to me and says, what? Huey just got arrested. I said, Huey got arrested? What the hell are you talking about? I said, he's supposed to be going to my house. He says, no, Bobby. As he crossed the street, the police rolled up and arrested him and said they said something about assault with a deadly weapon. I says, what? Hmm. And that's when Huey got arrested. Well, <laughs> my point is that was one of the first arrests I remember Huey went to, but I don't know. What did he do, serve six months in jail or something like that? Wow. And, that, that that was the early days, you know what I mean? Because Huey went on to try to defend himself in the courtroom because he did get bail and stuff, you know. And he tried to defend himself uh, himself without without a lawyer, you know, at that time. But he got convicted of a six and, and and was sentenced to six months. But those were the early days, you know, before the Black Panther Party started, in that period. All the other stuff we talked about, mine was always about a national big organization. Huey was saying we needed a smaller organization. I kept saying, no, we need a big organization. Am I we didn't. So we never really settled in agreement. I stuck to my need for a large organization. Huey kept saying a smaller organization. But my point is, is that Huey went to jail a year after we started the Black Panther Party. I come out of jail two months later. December of, of, of 1968, and I reorganized and restructured the Black Panther Party, okay, because the Black Panther Party really, up to that period, never had any more than 50 members in it, 50, okay. right. I'm not talking about 500, I'm talking about 50 members in the San Francisco Conveyor, that's all it had that first year, okay. Right. That's still a lot of so, people, though. 
Well, that's a whole lot of people. But me and Eldridge organized 400 people into this organization between December and February following Huey's birthday rally. Wow. See what's happening there? Right. Now. So this is 1968. We got 400 party members up and down the West Coast. We got a Los Angeles chapter that's now run by Bunchy Carter. We have a Seattle chapter that's run by the Dixon brother, Elmer Dixon and Aaron Dixon. These two young brothers put that organization together. It was part of a student organization, a um, black student organization conference at San Francisco State. And in effect, they was the one who, who heard me speak there. And uh, when I'm around. then we had a little Fresno group. Then we had this Oakland group. Now we had a West Oakland office. Uh, North, Oak, North Oakland office is the main one. And then we had Baby D, who was out of prison with, with Eldridge now, and he organized the Marin chapter in the black community of, in the city of Marin. And then we had uh, uh, the, the uh, Fillmore chapter and a little small Hunters Point group, and then one in Palo Alto. So by this time, this is all preceding Dr. Martin Luther King being killed. We had a little over 400 members up and down the West Coast only. Mm. It was not until Dr. Martin Luther King was killed that my organization spread across the country like wildfire. Wow. I went to all those chapters and all those branches across the United States of America. I would tell new chapters popping up and the ones that I knew and talking to them on the phone, etc., go to the colleges, get the colleges and the students, the black students and the anti-war students to get me a speaking fee and expenses. And I traveled with an entourage of two or three people. And those are the days we carried our pistols on the airline. This is before we were being searched on the airline. Wow. We got on the airline. I'm going to get on the airline with four people, two sisters and two brothers, and all of us armed. <laughs> wow. Because... It, it was about racism and racist threats. What are they going to do to us? Boom, 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 boom. My point is that we're not saying we can't get killed, but when you come up here <laughs> trying to shoot us with your racist stuff, we're shooting back, and we're not going to take it. You know what I mean? You're not going to just run around here and then somebody just mourn us. We're going to have them mourning your ass, too. <laughs> but my point becomes, I went to all those chapters and all those branches. I taught them the fine particulars and the methodology of effective community organizing. That's what I taught Black Panther Party members, the demographics. I reached, coming out of jail and Huey in jail and the party expanding, I extended the original rules to 28 rules. The first 10 rules Huey and I wrote together, the 10-point platform and program Huey and I wrote together, but the rules of the party, the, con the rules of conduct, with the expansion, I extended them rules to 28 rules. A lot of it was organizational-related rules. And then what I did is I structured what you call multiple leadership. You see, I wanted a large organization across country, and this is what was happening because Dr. Martin Luther King got killed. Young brothers and sisters wanted a Black Panther Party chapter or branch or something. Wow. And that's what I helped them do. And told them, I told them how to go about organizing a free breakfast program, how to contact all the... Uh, medical personnel and other people to help you put up a free preventative medical health clinic in the heart of the poor and low-income community. How to do this stuff. You see what I mean? Putting a sick cell anemia testing. How to, say, how to get a church to allow them to use your secondary facilities during the middle of the week sometime and allowance to people that they can get free sick cell anemia testing at the church. So the medical doctors who help and supervise that operation and other medics and people who come down to do that, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. We bring the people in and tell them it's a free sick cell anemia testing program. And people go, and that's how they did this stuff. And told Father Mary, I says, now, at the same time, you want to register as many of these brothers and sisters to vote. So you have to go to the county, county voter registrar's office to get authorization to be registrar. So they sent a better red registrar down in general. So we have people that. So... You see, the, what people don't understand is the political strategy that I had in terms of organizing the party. You know, it was not about a need for a shootout. It was about a need to organize and unify the people in the community so we could re-evolve more political, economic, and social justice empowerment into the hands of the people via legislation and policies that make human sense. 
Wow. This is what the political strategy was about. Well, this but is... the power structure attacked us. They right. came down on us. John Huggins and Bunchy Carter were murdered in Campbell Hall at UCLA. What was it? January 17th, if I'm not mistaken, 1969. Right, right. By the end of that year, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were killed. But they attacked and raided Black Panther Party offices all across the country from January to December. And the last shootout, four days after, after Fred Hampton was killed, happened in Los Angeles, California. Wow. Now, ask yourself the question, the average person must know, what stopped all the shootouts? What really happened? You know what I mean? Because the standing order that I had given, if we attack and they don't let us take the arrest, because our policy is we will take the arrest. But what they started doing, they started coming in shooting. Wasn't about taking no arrest. They wanted to kill up us so they could try to terrorize us out of existence. I said, therefore, we have to defend ourselves. I gave directives and I sent out architectural sketches how to build box systems, lines of box systems all the way around, three to four feet high up to the window seals, fill it with sand and dirt, pack it with sand and dirt. Mm -hmm. And I gave directors all over the country for officers to, go, to be, be like this. Fred Hadman was killed in an apartment. It wasn't an office. Right. And they didn't sandbag and fortify those places. Wow. Police broke in the back door and the front door, came in shooting. Wasn't no, they went in there and murdered and assassinated him, and which we've proved to the court child pro. But people asked the question, what stopped all those shootouts? Well, after the Los Angeles shootout, what happened was a young policeman in Berkeley, California, a young white policeman particularly, <laughs> bless his underground railroad soul, this guy stole the FBI and Berkeley police's plan to attack the national headquarters of the Black Panther Party and gave those plans, this young policeman, to our lawyer, Charles R. Gary. Wow. Young policeman lost his, yes, and we put it on the front pages. Wow. Police plan attack. And this is after Los Angeles had been attacked, after Fred Hampton had been attacked. The people in Los Angeles, when they shot it out for five hours, they made it. You know why? They were in an office and it was fortified like I had instructed. Wow. And Geronimo Pratt saw to it that it was that way. Because I told Geronimo Pratt about fortifying the offices in late 1968 when J. Hooper first said that we were a threat to internal security of America. I said, man, this means they're going to start attacking us. We got to fortify these offices. So I don't give a damn what it was the Berkeley headquarters, Los Angeles headquarters. Every office was in given directives to fortify. So that's what saved the brothers and sisters in uh, the Los Angeles chapter. What in effect happened after this policeman, after this policeman stole the plans of the FBI to attack our office, the white mayor up in Seattle, Washington, where Aaron Dixon and them ran that Black Panther Party chapter. The white mayor up there, he got on television and says, we want the FBI out of our, F our, our police department. We're not attacking them because the FBI, FBI is the ones that's coming in here to try to get our policemen to work with them to attack the Black Panthers, and we're not going to be attacking the Black Panthers, this young white mayor said. He says the Black Panthers have breakfast programs, they have uh, health clinic programs. They even have a hospice program here. And they have all other kinds of programs that serve in their community. And blah. So this all fed into all the other people all across the country denouncing the attacks on the Black Panther Party. I'm talking about, we're talking about over 200 organizational groups from top to bottom, NAACP, CORE, you name it, white left radical organizations, black organizations having press conferences and denouncing them for attacking the Black Panther Party offices. Wow. And with all these other things that happened, it fed into and caused the United States Senate to set up an investigation wow. of the FBI's concerted attempt to smash the party. And after that, there were never, ever any more police attacks on any Black Panther Party offices. The politics of it is what people's got to see. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah. <laughs> no, you... So, 
Yeah, so, so and what is, were they trying to stop? They, they were trying to stop our breakfast program. I mean, I have... You all, I have, it sounds like you all were embarrassing them and uh, showing the contradictions. No, we were dying. We were dying. No, I no. know that. I know we. you were serving the community, but in their minds, you oh, were yeah, embarrassing we were, them. We were embarrassing them in a whole lot of ways because when we started the first free breakfast program here in California, J. Edgar Hoover in uh, April, uh, March or April of 1969, jumps on television for the second time to say we are threat to the internal security of America. And he says the Black Panther's Breakfast for Children program is a threat to the internal security of America. You know, and what this was doing, Black Panthers hate all white folks. The only reason the Black Panthers have guns, J. Edgar Hoover said, is to come into the white community and shoot and kill white people. Now, how bold-faced of a lie is this? We're running up and down the streets with thousands of our white left radical buddies protesting together. Wow. <laughs> you know, and they're saying we hate all white folks. And I said, no, this is about all power to the people. And on page 69 of my book, Seeds of Time, Why We're Not Racist, I state that we will never, ever stoop to the low scurvy level of the mentality of a racist Ku Klux Klan just to hate another person just because of the color of their skin. That's absurd. This is not what it's about. You know, and I can make a distinction between a Ku Klux Klan racist, you see what I'm getting at, right. or a racist cop coming in because he's been ordered to shoot and kill us, and a white left radical out here protesting for my civil human rights. And getting his ass beat and police raised about it. <laughs> you know you know who your friends and your enemies are. You know what I mean? Some of them are white and, and some of them are not. So I'm just saying, this was mean history. Mean, real, take no crap from the racist pig power structure history. We meant that. When I said take no crap, I'm not talking about a shootout. We are going, we, we, we serious. We, we talking about changing some racist institutionalized crap. And this is what we run. So I'm saying we made our contribution because it caused a lot of organizations to come out for us, including Roy Wilkins with the NACP, Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy with the SCLC. In fact, Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy called me before Martin Luther King was killed, before he was killed, and asked me, Chairman Seal, I says, yes, sir, Dr. Reverend Ralph Abernathy. I says, and why, why am I honored with this call? And Dr. I mean, he says, Mr. Seal, Dr. King really wants, has me contacting more than 100 different organizations. He says, and of course, we would like, he wants to know, will you participate in several roundtable meetings in the next year or so? Uh, we're going to have a poor people's march is one thing. He says, but more important, the round tables, we want to outline and hammer out some practical economic goal objectives for one. What year Dr. was this? King. What year did he do this? 1968, before Martin Luther King was killed, brother. 1968. He called wow. me six, seven weeks before he was killed. Dr. Abernathy called me six, seven weeks before he was killed. And I'm just saying that. When you say working, when you say coalition politics, you, you not only cross racial lines, you cross you, you cross your own uh, organizational lines. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah, no, this is. I mean, this is key. I mean, a lot of people. Well, really this is really... one of the great. This is one of the great characteristics that I saw too. That would happen. I mean, Elders Cleaver kind of kicked it off in organizing it, but coalition politics. You see what I'm getting at? Right. In opposition of institutionalized racism in opposition to racist exploitation, in opposition to fascist tactics, in opposition to what we used to call the pig power structure, you see. So, I mean, this is where we were coming from. And I, by the end of 1969, I had 28 dead Black Panther Party members. And there were 12 dead policemen, 12, in our shootouts in terms of trying to defend ourselves. They attacked every Black Panther Party office practically in this country. And, you know, at one point or another, particularly in the year of 1969. But the Senate investigation here and following that caused the, the attacks to stop. You know, as, as we, um, you know, because we're going to have to stop here, but this is uh, incredible um, information. Do you see a parallel to any of the movements today in terms of the tactics used to shut 
folks down and demonize and all that, you know, like the Occupy movement or some of the other attempts to organize around well, something? Well, pe people like Newt Gingrich, the Tea Party people, politicians on the right wing Republican side primarily, you know, are about stereotype. Well, what did Newt Gingrich say? Oh, to tell the Occupy group to take a bath and go get a job. You know, this, this guy this guy working from some extended fascist notions from from the 60s. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah, the, 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 to shut down, you know, really the Oakland Occupy movement needed some kind of coalition relationship with the businessmen. And then there was the anarchists who jumped in to cause a little riots downtown. See, the Occupy movement has to be a peaceful protest movement, you know? And one of those last confrontations down there, I think the anarchists came in and tried to start some rioting. Well, some of the Occupy people got fire extinguishers as well and put out the fire that the anarchists started, okay? Right. Now, I know that there's a lot of anarchists out there sincere anarchists, you know, but there's, that, you know, Kropotkin anarchists following uh, the, the other anarchist leader of the 1800s, he talked more about programs and cooperatives, you see what I'm getting at, and people's community control of things. Well, that's me. I'm a community control economist, okay? Constitutional democratic community control. I believe in constitutional democratic greater constitutional democratic community control of economic frameworks that retail and produce services and goods. Now, when you start looking at the economy and you see the small businessmen, the main street business people, they are immediate to a lot of people in the community. They are part of this community control. You know, let them own their businesses. The point I'm getting at is trying to get them to understand those small businessmen your, you need to hitch your wagon to this 99% people human liberation effort. You see what I mean? Right. So you got to pull that together. You see what I'm getting at? Now, I notice Obama has not come out and said nothing negative, per se, about the Occupy movement. Ah, interesting, right? Right. <laughs> it was necessary. Because if he had done it, I'd have really been pissed off at him, okay? Because that meant he would have been trying to appease some right-wingers. You said I'm getting at and he shouldn't be trying to do that. You know what I mean? Right. So lately, the brother has got on his high horse. He's realized he's not going to get any partisan partnership with them, et cetera. But he lets them dig them, dig themselves a hole. And, and, and the politics of what he's doing now is getting ready to kick the Republicans' butt. And we need to kick the Republicans' butt. We need to have that, that, that Democratic process to take over. And I'm not saying all Democrats is what's happening. That's not the point. But Congresswoman Barbara Lee pointed out to me some time ago, you know, Barbara Lee is a very good friend. You know what I mean? Barbara yeah. Lee worked with the Black Panther Party as a community worker, my God, five years, you know, while she was still going to Mills College and stuff back in the day when she worked with Shirley Chisholm and so on, et cetera, and the Black Panther Party, you know what I mean? Right. So as she's a United States, she's a shining symbol, and she's symbolic and practical and relevant to the type of people that I wanted to see politically elected when I had my first strategy together of electing a lot of more black politicians. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah. When the Black Panther Party started, there were less than 50, less than 50 black people or people of color duly elected to any political office seat in the United States of America. Now, think. Get America to think. There are 500,000 political seats one can be elected to in America. When you take into account all the city council seats for all the small cities and large cities, all the county seat and county supervisorial seats of all the small counties and large counties, and all the states, 50 states in the United States of America, when you add all of this stuff up, including the federal legislature, the state legislature, and other political seats, it's 500,000 political seats. In the middle of the 1960s, we had less than 50 black folks duly elected to political office all across the United States of America. Any colored people of color, I'm talking about Asian, uh, Chicano, Mexican-American, uh, 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 black, etc. You see what I'm getting at? Now, what happened there? With the 60s protest movement, the dynamic of it, etc., blah, blah, 
when you look at that thing, I says, whoa, by the end of the 1970s, they had 7,000 black folks duly elected to political office. Going from 50 by to 70,000. By the end 70, of the 000. 80s, they had 10,000 duly elected. By the end of the 90s, they had 15,000 duly elected. Now, it became matched with women, women being in office, because that was important, too, in terms of our political electorate in the, con in the country. You see what I'm getting at? Ah, and then when you start seeing... A great in the last what my God well let us talk in the last twenty years Mexican American Chicano brothers and people boom they have whoa rolled into the whole political arena what is Arizona all about it is about trying to stop that growth of Mexican Americans registered to vote status I mean in the state of Arizona alone what is they they removed in a three to five year period preceding all of this um, this, this this profiling. They remove a hundred thousand people off the voter rolls. Mexican American people. They're voting voting growth. So McCain and others, the white power who runs uh, Arizona, they are scared of that, and so they're going to do everything they can to curtail it, to curtail Mexican American people from voting and take it over those same political seats, the same strategy I had. You have to have people that's coming from the grassroots getting into some of these political seats so they can hopefully evolve legislation and policy that make human sense. Everything that the 99% Occupy movement is saying today is interconnected and interrelated with the very 10-point platform and program of the Black Panther Party and all other kind of issues and problems before the Black Panther Party. Well, there you have it. That's real talk. You know, Brother Bobby Seal, we appreciate you taking time out. Um, we have run out of time here. <laughs> we can probably okay. go on another two hours. But this is incredible information, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time out this afternoon to uh, okay. uh, really shed some light. Thank you. Holding you down and keeping you on points. Breakdown at them. The only station in the nation that's down by law. On all day play, on all day play, all day play. A black fist covered by a black glove. A black sister and black brother is black love. A black gas sound like thunder, so back up. Or you can find your black ass covered in black mud. You ever see a black diamond is black cold. Soldiers over Iraq time for black gold A beauty mark on your face is a black mold The birthplace of all music, the black soul This is the beginning of time, we that old About to start a revolution like cash flow And with that desire came a search for a black messiah The Edgar Hoover had his tapped and wide Cause he knew it just takes one match to catch a fire Burn, baby, burn till you black it in the tire You earn what you earned and what you earned is a earn From your perm to your sperm, not a germ for the worms From slick to the pampers, this is the answer The question is how you gon' get rid of cancer So you can go to chemo when the whole body suffers Or you can get a knife and cut out the mother See violence is American, it's cherry pie They wanna leave a wide awake man Buried alive cause we your worst nightmare And you scared of our rise, that's no freedom in the air Are you prepared to die? Let's a black fist covered by a black glove A black sister and black brother is black love A black gas sound like thunder so back up Or you can find your black ass covered in black mud You ever see a black diamond is black coal Soldiers over Iraq die for black gold A beauty mark on your face is a black mold The first place of all yeah, music yeah. the black soul What you know about Bobby Seale or Huey P On the streets of Oakland fighting to live free Free like a soda cause she put it on the line Lil' Bobby Hunt gon' live forever in time I do this for the struggle of the New York 21 A Fenny Shakur, that was Tupac's mom And if you live for revolution, your life will be eternal Cause ideas in the struggle, man, can never be murdered You can't kill the revolution, too many seeds planted It's only a matter of time, it's always my answer When they ask me when I think it's gon' all go down Chairman Freddie Hampton organized in Shot Town. I'm like Eldridge in Africa, living in exile. Them Panthers spoke loud, them Panthers had style. Black leather jacket with the beret to match. Sunglass swag, red book in his hand. A black fist covered by a black glove. A black sister and black brother is black love. A black gas sound like thunder, so back up. Or you can find your black ass covered in black mud. You 
you ever see a black diamond is black gold Soldiers over Iraq dying for black gold A beauty mark on your face is a black mold The birthplace of all music, the black soul Yeah, Black Panthers Inspiration for the struggles of today We learn from the past to fight for the future Pantera Negra Internacionalmente visto como revolucionario Luchando por el pueblo Power to the people